Okay, so I wanted to start um, the nervous system because we are three units behind, um, but I've already, I have a plan for that. So everything will be covered in time for you guys. Um, you won't miss out on anything anyway, so don't worry about it. Okay, so today's topic is going to be on the transmission of nerve impulses. I'm going to start by um, talking about the structure of a neuron and then explaining how um, an impulse travels through the nerve. So this is an animation of how <clears throat> uh, nerve impulses work. The first thing that I wanna point out is, I think you can only really see it on this neuron right here, but they always go in one direction. So even though it's just a GIF repeating over and over, um, Nerve impulses always go from the dendrites, which are these long thingies extending out through the cell body, down the axon to the axon terminals. That's one of the things that um, I'll be covering today. The ability of your nervous system to function depends on the transmission of these signals within a neuron and from one neuron to another. The impulses are called action potentials. This is the transmission of a signal along the axon of a neuron. So overall, we talk about an impulse going from one neuro neuron to another, but when you're talking about how it travels through the axon, which is this stalk thick part here, that's the action potential. Action potentials depend on electrochemical energy. This is electrical energy made as charged chemicals moved in and move in and out of neurons. Now, the two charged particles that are gonna be talking about are sodium, and potassium. If that sounds familiar, it should, because last year when we talked about um, transport in and out of cells, one of the um, active transport methods that we use are called um, cell membrane pumps. And one pump in particular is called the sodium potassium pump. And I did explain back then, and I'll explain again, just very quickly. Basically, if you're looking at the cell membrane, you pump three sodium ions out and you pump two potassium ions in because each of those ions has an, a charge of plus one. Uh, that means that you're having a, a, an unbalanced transfer or exchange of uh, ions. And the top speed I think of this is 150 cycles per second. So you're basically transporting 450 sodium ions out and only 300 sodium, or per, sorry, potassium ions in every second. What that's going to do is it's going to create a concentration gradient. But in this example, it's an electrical gradient across the membrane. So you have a more positive environment outside and a more negative environment inside. But again, I'll go more into detail about that and why it matters when I discuss how an action potential actually moves down the axon. Okay, so here is the basic structure of a neuron. First, we have the dendrites, which are these like long hair-like extensions, which extend out from the cell body. Um, action potentials are always going to come in through this way and leave that way. So dendrites are there to be able to receive an action potential from um, many different sources. The axon, of course, is the long part of the, uh, of the neuron. And this is where the action potential is going to be transmitted away from the cell body. Neurons can have either a single axon or branching axons that contact several other neurons, but the axon terminal are the ends of the axon. An axon terminal can rely, uh, can rely, can lie near a muscle, gland, or the dendrite or cell body of another neuron. The axons of most neurons are covered with a lipid layer called the myelin sheath. Again, this is um, phonetic pronunciation. So this syllable is the one that is stressed. That's why it's in all caps. And you pronounce it the way that it looks, myelin. So you can see that the myelin sheath is this um, yellow color. And the myelin sheath, remember lipids are nonpolar. 
So they are insulators when it comes to electric charge, because you have to remember an action potential is basically um, a transfer of charge as you go down the axon. And it works exactly the same way that the, um, the rubber coating on the outside of our electrical wires works. If you have a charging cable or your TV cord, whatever, all of the wires that we use to connect our electrical devices to a source of electricity are all covered with um, some kind of either a plastic or rubber coating because it helps to insulate. So you imagine if you had, um, hold on, yeah, it just showed up. Oh, it's the mouse. Oops. Okay. So imagine if you had like um, a charging cord that started fraying or like coming apart, then you're going to lose some of the elect that electricity. And actually one of my charging cords um, right near the base where the USB plugs in, um, the, the insulating co cover is splitting. And so you can see all the individual wires coming out and I have a real problem charging, charging my watch because of that. Uh, okay, so it insulates the axon like the rubber on an electrical cord, same, same concept. This helps to speed up transmission of action potentials through the axon. In the peripheral nervous system, which um, I, haven't, I don't talk about the, the division of the nervous system until section two, but that's okay. Basically, you've got two, um, the nervous system is divided up very in a very organized way of the CNS and PNS. The CNS is the central nervous system. This is the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is everything else. So in the peripheral, peripheral nervous system, which is everything except the brain and spinal cord, the myelin is made by cells called Schwann cells, which are these things that you see here. Schwann cells surround the axon. Oops. Oh, I hope that let that person in. Okay, and then you can see here we have gaps in the myelin sheath, uh, which are called the nodes of Ranvier. And what this does is in the peripheral nervous system, it actually helps to speed up uh, action potentials. Sorry, I'm trying to let O in the class. Uh, there we go. Oh, and of course, that goes away. Try that again, shall we? All right. So once again, the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, everything else. In the peripheral, peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath, which is that lipid bilayer or lipid layer, is made by Schwann cells that surround the axon and you have gaps. The gaps speed up the impulse because the, the impulse will then jump over the myelin sheath and hop to the nose of Ranvier. Okay, so what you see here, this is the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell, a synapse is um, a transfer, I guess, is the best way I can describe it, a transfer of an impulse from one neuron to the next. So here are these little circles that you see here. These are little um, vesicles full of neurotransmitters. And I'll talk about those um, in more detail later, but basically um, you can have an electrical signal that can move through the axon, but it can't jump over the space. I don't know if you remember last year when I first started teaching you biology, but um, no two cells are like physically right next to each other. They don't actually touch like cell membrane to cell membrane. There's always an intercellular space. And so here you can see, here's the membrane of the presynaptic cell and the membrane of the postsynaptic cell and the synaptic cleft or synapse. That's the space between the two neurons. And so these neurotransmitters are basically chemicals that are going to be able to jump that space, jump that gap because electrical signals and electrical like ions cannot just like pass over a gap. 
So neurons don't touch each other. There's a small gap between the axon of one neuron and the dendrite or cell body of another neuron. Okay, and then again, these circular vesicles you see up here, these are neurotransmitters. Neuro meaning um, related to the nervous system and transmitters, well, they transmit, they, they cross a space, like they transfer. Okay, so neurotransmitters are going to basically carry a signal in chemical form across the gap between the neurons, and they may or may not cause an electrical disturbance in the postsynaptic membrane. It all depends on whether or not it meets the threshold. Um, kind of like in chemistry, when we talk about activation energy, there is a certain level of stimulation that this cell needs in order for the signal to continue. So signaling activity of the nervous system is made of electrical activity inside neurons, but it's chemical between neurons. Almost 200 years ago, scientists discovered that when you pass a, an electric current through the muscle of a dead animal, the muscle still works even as if the animal was still alive. The electricity stimulates the neurons that affect the muscle cells. So neuron function is dependent on electrical activity. As I said, the neurons have an electrical charge different from the extracellular fluid around them. This is what's called potential. I don't know if you studied um, electricity and potential in um, physics yet, but it's basically just an, a, a difference in electrical charge between two locations. In chemistry, that's measured in voltage. And in biology, for neuron action potentials, it's me measured in millivolts. The potentials are made by the complex actions of several different ions. The movement of those ions is affected by their ability to pass through the cell membrane, the concentrations both inside and outside the axon, and their charge. So there's a lot of things going on. But um, overall, I guess in the beginning, it's kind of confusing, but once you understand, it makes sense. So there's going to be two potentials in a neuron. There's resting potential and there's action potential. Resting potential is exactly what the name suggests. It is the potential of the neuron at rest when it is not receiving or transmitting a signal. So at rest, the concentration of large negatively charged proteins and potassium ions are greater inside the axon than outside. So again, we have an axon here. Inside the axon, we have these giant negative proteins, which I'll just over-exaggerate. And we also have potassium ions. Yeah, okay, got a diagram anyway. Okay, so you can see based on the diagram that at resting potential, and you can even see um, the millivolts here in the graph. So this is basically your action potential here. So this is at rest, right? We start at, let's say negative 75-ish. So it's about right, right between minus 50, minus 100. When the action potential occurs, the, um, the potential is going to shoot up to plus 50. And then afterwards, it's going to dip all the way down to almost negative 100, it's around minus 90 until it finally goes back up to resting potential, which is about minus 70, 75. But the bottom line is at resting potential, the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside. I don't mean that it has an actual negative charge, but we are talking about a potential, which is just a difference between um, the electric charge across a space and the space is the, uh, cell membrane. I hope that makes sense. The concentration of sodium ions is greater outside than inside. And remember the sodium potassium pump, we pump three sodium out and we pump two potassium in, even though at resting potential, this goes against their concentration gradient, which is why it's considered active transport. 
Okay, so this imbalance is partly due to the sodium potassium pump, which we learned last year. Now, one of the things that I mentioned before uh, is that, where is it? Here we go, this one. The movement of ions is affected by ability to pass through the membrane, the concentrations inside and outside and their charge. Well, the charge I can say probably doesn't really matter because both sodium and potassium have a positive charge. The only thing that I would mention here is maybe the proteins inside, which have a negative charge. So I've already talked about the concentration of ions inside and outside. So at resting potential, potassium's on the inside, sodium's on the outside. Now, the second part, uh, the permeability of ions with the membrane. So the cell membrane is permeable to some ions, but not others. The sodium ions do not diffuse easily. So they build up on the outside, right? So sodium ions cannot go through the cell membrane. Negatively charged proteins are too big, so they are stuck on the inside. But the axon membrane is permeable to potassium ions. Now, because if I go back to, well, I'll just draw it here. I've got negative proteins. I've got lots of potassium inside, lots of sodium outside. The sodium cannot diffuse inside, even though the concentration outside is higher, but potassium, they call it leaky, L-E-A-K-Y, leaky. They say the cell membrane is leaky for potassium. So potassium can leak out. And this is why we say that at rest, the inside of the axon is negative compared to the extracellular fluid. So, Again, the exit of positively charged ions, which are the potassium ions, in combination with these giant negative proteins inside causes the interior of the, the neuron to be negatively charged compared to the outside. This is the resting potential. And in animal neurons, this is about minus 70 millivolts. Now, the action potential, you can see in the diagram already, what you have is a sodium channels opening up. So sodium is going to rush in, right? You see the, the red circles are the sodium. And now you see on the right-hand side, how the potential um, almost reverses itself. It shoots up to um, about plus 50, I think. So the permeability in the membrane changes when a cell body or a dendrite is stimulated. The point where the neuron is stimulated, the cell membranes are permeable to sodium ions because the sodium channel opens up. This inward rush of sodium ions changes the inside of the axon. It becomes more positive than the outer surface, which is why you can see the potential shooting up here the inside of the membrane becomes positive because all of these um, sodium ions rush in. So you've got potassium and sodium inside. Okay, so here is a, a kind of an animation of how it would travel down the axon because um, you see how the, what do you call it? this thing that's coming down. This is what's called a depolarization. Oof. It's called depolarization because you're turning the inside and outside opposite charge from each other. So when these sodium gates first open, that causes the next sodium gates to open and the next and next and next and next and next. So it's like a wave. If you're ever at a football game, if we ever get to go out in public again um, and you, you see the crowd doing a wave, that's the same thing. So here we can see how the sodium moves in and the potassium rushes out. And then we have a reversal as well. So as the first part 
of the axon becomes positive. It opens nearby charges. So the sodium drives the voltage in a positive direction, opening the channel. So you can see the sodium rushing in here. This is the uh, cellular membrane. So that wave of positive charge passes down the membrane of the axon. So the action potential travels in one direction only away from the cell body because of this. Can't go back and forth. You only go down in one direction because you start with opening these channels first and then this channel makes that channel open, that one, that one, that one. And you go down that way. Shortly after the sodium channels open, they're going to close which means sodium is now trapped inside. And then the voltage gated channels for potassium open. So you have this huge flow of potassium ions outside. So this is going to reverse the polarity again. And that is the end of the action potential. Now, this is the point where you started here at minus 70. You, sh you shoot up to plus 50. When, uh, this is when the sodium gates open. When the potassium gates open is when you dip down like this. And then this is a key period. This is called the refractory period because at the end of the action potential, you've opened the sodium channels. So sodium is all on the inside and they are impermeable which means they can't diffuse out of the cell anymore. They're trapped inside. After the sodium gates open, they close and they cause the potassium gates to open. So potassium rushes out because remember there's more potassium on the inside than outside. So now you've repolarized the membrane, which means it's positive on the outside, negative on the inside, but these two ions are on the wrong side of the membrane because remember at, at resting potential, there was more sodium on the outside more potassium on the inside, and now it's the opposite. And this is where the sodium potassium pump comes in. Until the ions are restored to their proper side of the membrane, that's the refractory period. So after the action potential, the concentration of sodium ions inside is abnormally high because don't forget, sodium ions can't leak through the membrane and the concentration of potassium is abnormally low. So the sodium potassium pump is going to recreate those original concentrations. This action occurs in all neurons of the body. Neurons transmit this information through changes in the electrical potential of the membrane by the movement of ions across the membrane. An electrochemical gradient governs the movement of these pump. ions, resulting in an electrical impulse. The resting membrane potential in a neuron, when the cell is not firing an impulse, is established by the unequal distribution of sodium ions outside of the cell and potassium ions inside the cell, making the outside of the cell more positively charged compared to the inside. The electrochemical gradient is established and maintained by an enzyme called sodium potassium ATPase. When a neuron is stimulated, sodium ion channels open and sodium ions flow into the cell. This leads to a change in the electrical potential across the membrane called depolarization. The depolarizing electrical potential travels down the dendrites and over the cell body. Multiple electrical potentials will combine at the axon hillock in a process called summation. If the depolarization is large enough, an action potential is triggered. Kind of like action potentials energy. are all or none electrical impulses that maintain their amplitude and strength down the length of the axon. The action potential travels down the axon when the depolarization of an area of membrane causes adjacent voltage-gated sodium ion channels to open. The influx of sodium ions results in membrane depolarization along the membrane. After a short delay, potassium ion channels open and potassium ions flow out, repolarizing the membrane. For the neuron to fire again, the resting membrane potential needs to be re-established. 
Sodium-potassium ATPase is used to move sodium and potassium ions against their concentration gradients, re-establishing the resting membrane potential. As the action potential moves down the axon, ions are diffusing only a short distance, allowing the signal to move quickly. At the axon terminal, the electrical impulse passes to another cell at a cellular connection called a synapse. The space between the presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic cell is called the synaptic cleft. The presynaptic neuron contains signal molecules called neurotransmitters that are packaged inside vesicles. When an action potential reaches the end of a neuron, neurotransmitters are released by exocytosis from the neuron into the synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitters bind to the adjacent cell at receptor sites attached to ion channels. The channels open, allowing the movement of ions into or out of the effector cell, which alters its membrane potential, thereby transmitting the signal from the neuron to the effector cell. Because nerve impulses move very rapidly down the axon of a neuron and move from cell to cell across synapses, you react quickly to a stimulus, like burning your finger. Okay, so at the end, the axon terminal, that's where the neurotransmitters are stored, as she said in the video. And so these vesicles are going to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and use exocytosis. That's another, um, another blast from the past last year, exocytosis. So these fuse with the presynaptic membrane. They're going to release the neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft. And then the neurotransmitters will bind to the receptor proteins here on the cell and then cause the ion channels to open here. Okay. The interaction of neurotransmitters and receptor molecules changes the permeability of the postsynaptic membrane. Basically, it causes the ion channels on the postsynaptic membrane to open. So opening the sodium channels in the postsynaptic membrane causes the neuron to become more positive in charge. If that membrane potential is high enough, a new action potential is made in the receiving neuron. And this is one of the reasons why neurons have many dendrites. So um, as she said in the video, that the process called summation, it's an all or nothing response. So just like uh, activation energy, there has to be a certain threshold of um, stimulus that reaches the, uh, what they call the hillock or the, the neck of the axon in order to cause the action potential to be transferred down the axon. And that's why you have all of these dendrites out here so that you can receive a bunch of stimulus um, for this particular neuron. If the uh, membrane potential is not high enough, then the signal is going to end here and it won't be transferred any further. Okay. That was a marathon of, uh... oh, why is it not working now? Holy cow. No, back to meetings. 